Okay. Uh, yeah, this is going. Um, today I'm presenting a thing that's been lingering in the back of my head for a couple of years now uh, that I've been just trying to make sense of. Um, and it gets into other people's perspectives on grid cells and how sometimes they use um, analogies to eigenvectors or to the Fourier transform uh, to talk about grid cells. Uh, and in this presentation, I'm going to lay out um, a mapping to that, to that terminology where most of the things we talk about with grid cells can be described in that terminology. Um, and I'll try to make this very um, uh, like picturesque. Or it, it's, not, it's not a bunch of symbols. It's, I'm, tr I'm trying to kind of bring it to life and, and take what we've talked about, map it into this, um, and it'll serve a couple purposes. One is that it, you know, it gives us a way to look at what we've done from another angle. Um, it, can also, it also provides suggestions of, of where we can go. Um, and, uh, and I'll also consider um, an, the alternate take on grid cells, where, where when sometimes, sometimes people talk about grid cells as being principal components of place cells or principal components of location. And I wanna um, show how that kind of fits into this and say what I like and dislike about that idea. Uh, so I'll go ahead and, and share this. Just a second. Uh, and go into presentation mode. Um, okay, so in this, I, I, this is like a big whiteboard essentially, and I'll zoom out to show you kind of, oops, that's in. I'm gonna zoom out, not like that. Still figuring out how to use this. Um, there we go. Uh, and so, so the way this is kind of structured is, um, going straight down, kind of the straight line going down through is, um, is taking what we've already talked about and putting it in this language. Um, and the, and going off to the side as, as, uh, as alternate directions that you can go. Uh, so, so kind of the main through line of this presentation is down through the center, but I'll take a couple offshoots that, that uh, where there are these interesting ideas that can be discussed. Uh, so in the, in the first part, I'm going to just lay out what I mean by an eigenvector and what and how that fits into this uh, context of grid cells. Um, then I'll, I'll jump into uh, uh, the question of um, should we think of entorhinal cortex in the hippocampal formation as processing graphs or should we think of it as processing space? And you'll see what I mean when I say that. Um, I ultimately come back to thinking about it as space, but there's some interesting things to talk about over here. Uh, and so if, if, if finally, I'll say that like, now that we see that all this resembles the Fourier transform or eigenvectors so much, what new ideas can we draw from that? Uh, so this will be where I'm not just putting new language on it anymore. I'm, I'm showing new cool ideas. Okay, so I'll, I'll start at the beginning. And I'll hide this just to make it less crowded. Um, okay, here I want to tell you a, just to give you a simple definition of eigenvector and what you, the mental image you can have when we talk about eigenvectors. So imagine you're representing the location of an animal or any 1D variable on a, a, a like a location of an animal on a 1D track using a vector, uh, yeah, using a vector of like states basically saying that the, it's a one hot vector. This rat is here because uh, you're encoding that using a one there. And now say you take these states and treat it as a Markov chain. Uh, and here I've put these probabilities on here of like, you know, 25% walk left, 25% walk right, 50% stay still. And, um, and, and I've just said, say you use this uniform random walk policy uh, for, for, this, for this animal. Uh, you can put these probabilities in a transition matrix, uh, that this transition matrix that then takes in this vector. And if you apply this matrix to the vector, uh, like using a standard matrix vector multiplication, in this case, what you would get is you'd kind of diffuse the one outward. It's like uh, that one analogy people have used is this like a droplet of ink on paper and, and you watch the ink slowly fade to the side. Uh, that, that's kind of what is happening here. Uh, this random walk policy will kind of diffuse the bump outward. Um, is, that, is that suggesting that there's uncertainty of where the animal is or just representing the probabilities where it will be? Uh, it, it, it's both. I, it's um, okay. 
probabilities of where it will be. Uh, you, okay. you could interpret this as if you look away and you're trying to, if you're tracking someone else's location, if you're tracking a rat's location and you look away, this is in your head, you might have this going on where you're keeping track of where the rat might be. Um, or if the rat doesn't have any sensory motor system, it just has, um, you know, time-based system. This might be how it keeps track of where it is. Well, like I was just trying to say if, if this is on this probability is where it is or where it will be. It seems like it's obviously where it will be, but it seems like if you could observe the animal, you would know exactly where it is. So right, right. So so that is one that is one kind of strange thing here is that um, if you were actually simulating a random walk, you wouldn't diffuse this. You would choose randomly. You would choose one direction and go. Uh, so it's it's more a probability distribution of where it's going to be in the future. Uh, so, so this, uh, this is a, like, it started out as like a one hot vector encoding a location. Um, but for some vectors, if you, if you just freely can paint these any color you want or, fit, or set them to any number you want, um, certain vectors, when you apply the random walk policy, uh, they, they just, they, they kind of fade. They, they get scaled down uniformly. Uh, they don't. They don't change their shape. They just become a less, uh, like a less extreme version of their shape. And these vectors are eigenvectors. The the ones that, uh, in other terms, you could say the high dimensional direction the vector points doesn't change. Only its only its magnitude changes. But you can always just picture it as uh, as like paint fading, as colors fading by a, by a, the same scalar. And. The reason uh, eigenvectors get talked about a lot um, is I'm sorry, that, you, I'm sorry Marcus, you lost me already, and I'm oh, afraid, okay. I'm afraid I, if you lose me, I'm going to lose the rest of it. So, um, I mean, what uh, my knowledge of eigenvectors goes back many years ago, and it, it doesn't seem to relate too much what I'm seeing here. So, so <laughs> it's mostly my ignorance. Um, but I don't, I don't understand the idea of this fading. Um, uh, you say successively applying a, um, I'm d can you just try to give me yeah. the verbal equivalent of what's going on here again? Okay, yeah. Uh, and why there's so, two eigenvectors, what are they, you know? Um, and, and here, and also in the coloring scheme here, you showed it repeating, is that is that the repeating, uh, equivalent to the repeating grid cell module? Is that what that is? That's gonna come into this soon, yes. I mean, because why are there two red spots uh, or three red spots and two blue spots? Is that what that represents? B because the way this is analytically handled, it's, it's, it's a wraparound track. Okay, so th that is the, then that is the repetition of the grid cell, is that right? Yes. Okay, because in your, in your vector above, you didn't show enough points to show that, um, right? You just showed uh, one yeah. point being active. So now we're, we're, now we're showing a longer track so no, so 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 this was representing. This is a one-hot vector for where the rat is, and then I made a point that this is not an eigenvector because it's not simply being scaled; it's being kind of diffused. It's yeah. uh, it's it, it's its shape is changing. Um, these are not one-hot vectors, but they, they they I could have plugged numbers into here to get these or to get discrete versions of these. Guess I'm losing it here. Um, yeah, I'm also not sure. Um, so when you say re successively applying a, is you, you take that single position up top and you apply a once and you get that, vec the the yellow and orange vectors that we're seeing, and yeah. if you keep uh, applying a multiple times to that same position, it, you no that you don't get saying? these. Right. So what what is how do you get from I'm I'm. I'm a little confused where you, how you get from AX to those eigenvectors, I guess. <laughs> yeah, so uh, there is a special set of vectors that you can solve for uh, that are not this one, uh, that, that, that are not this one, um, that, that have this property that they're, in a sense, they're, th this will always be a shade of red, this will always be a shade of blue, but this will always be white. But what matrix are you taking the eigenvectors of? That's what this I'm one. trying to figure. The, the, this, this matrix that is a diagonal of 0.5 on the diagonal and 0.25 just on one off of the diagonal. And everything else is zeros? Yes. Okay. 
I'm still, I'm still stuck, and I don't want to. If, if uh, I'll okay, give so it one more not, try. Okay, so it's not successively. So th these eigenvector ones and twos are eigenvectors of A. It's not yes. eigenvectors after successively applying A. I guess that correct. Was the, correct. Okay. This is okay. an eigenvector of A, and no matter, and this isn't just being scaled up and down. So oh, these eigenvectors, these eigenvectors, I can no longer uh, interpret them as positions on a track. Is that right? These are um, right, or like you could almost think of them as like a, a um, as a union of positions on the track, uh, or you could think of them as um, as you know in visual cortex on and off subregions. Uh, mm -hmm. you, you see color maps of where the cell responds and where the cell doesn't respond. Mm -hmm. This is becoming more similar to that. Uh, this is more of where a, you could imagine a unit that is responding to these, to these locations, but not to these locations. Uh, that, those are two different ways of looking at this. You can, you can say that this is either well, a representation of three locations, or this is the, the rate map for a cell. And that in the visual cortex we were referring to that was a non-moving 2D type of thing. Um, but how does that apply now to the, again, I'm trying to, is there any mapping between these color coded bars and the position on of the rat on the, on the track? Would they say that this particular cell might respond to multiple places on the track, but it's not actually a grid cell. You're saying it's a, it's, it's I'm, 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 bu I'm building up to where this is a visualization of a, of a ring, but I haven't gotten there yet. Okay, because that looks uh, like a ring. So, um, all right. And then, and the idea of fading. What's the what, what, what's the point of that? What's the, what, why are we doing that? What's where's that going? Why are you changing the scalars? Well, okay. The definition of an eigenvector is. Um, is so so look at it in this view with the numbers this mm -hmm. is a what a an eight dimensional vector pointing in eight dimensional space um and i could have drawn these that same way uh, eight dimensional vector point in eight dimensional space and when you apply a when you apply this random walk that vector continues pointing in the same direction but it just gets shorter uh this is the definition of an eigenvector okay and um, but and these the are, reason, go on. Uh, but you're showing four different shades here. I, oh, those are all eigenvectors, right? Just, yeah, the, the, this, is, this is an eigenvector that, um, that is being scaled up and down, but it's, it's all the same eigenvector. I guess, I guess I'm trying to, the scaling thing, why is that important? Why are we doing it? Where is that going to go? Is that, that's, that, is that, that's not part of what eigenvectors are, is it? Is this, it's just something we've decided to do in this case? Is that, I'm just trying to understand why. No, that's what eigenvectors are. The, 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 the fact that the fact that when I apply this matrix to this vector, uh, it becomes a lower magnitude version of itself. It gets scaled down. Every point on this track is scaled. But, why, but why are we doing it successively? I don't, what's the logic behind that? Um, well, you, you don't just doing it once is, is uh, okay, enough. You're, but, it sounds like we're trying to you show a progression of these as if it's something we want to do. Uh, I'm just. Oh, just no, I'm just, I'm stating this is what makes it an eigenvector that okay. no, no matter I, how many times did someone say can something? Can I just ask a quick question, which might yeah. be relevant to, uh, so, cause here the, the vector is kind of representing pro, uh, transition probabilities. Um, and so when you're scaling, um, can you help me kind of visualize what's happening to the transition probabilities around kind of where is is the idea that it's kind of becoming more uniform? Well, okay. So so the vector the vector which tells you the probabilities of where you might be. Um, yeah. Is yes, it's becoming more uniform. It's 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 slowly and as time approaches infinity, it's going to become totally uniform. It's going to become yeah. Okay. No, that, I think that helps to yeah. Could you explain to me when you say successfully applying A, I'm thinking you're taking A to some power and applying it to X. Is that what's going on? Those are the same thing, yes. Okay. So in effect, if you are, uh, if, you, if you take A squared, what does that look like? That would be the second row, I guess. No, I mean, what does it or, look like? No, no, no. A, A squared would be this except spread out further. 
Okay, so like, you're essentially t you're essentially heading toward a Gaussian because you're taking a block thing and multiple uh, multiplying it multiple times. So it's it's assuming a Gaussian characteristic, right? In terms, of I guess how that, that's not the direction I'm going with this. Uh, if you if you so the whole point of this part is to define what an eigenvector is in the context of location. No, I understand, uh, understand but you, you could represent. Not, there's not going to be a point in this talk again where I apply A successfully, successively. Okay, but what, but, I, what, I, what I'm saying, if you're, if you're going to have that scaling factor, that, that fading basically would be absorbed in the eigenvalue, right? Yes. So these things remain normalized, it's just the eigenvalue is somehow decreasing. And to, to, since the term has come in, uh, the vector, the scaling factor that keeps get, keeps getting applied successively is its eigenvalue. Okay. Um, and so I, I'm just, since you brought in the term, I decided to introduce it. Uh, and um, and in this case, these waves are cosine waves uh, because a is translation invariant and it's a random walk and it's symmetric. Uh, and so that's why that's why cosines have come out of this. Uh, I, the, the general mental image I want, though, is like is to to convey is um, how can you paint the track? How, how can can it? Yeah, how can you paint the color colors on this track uh, so that a random walk um, leads to it fading like this and and not uh, the colors not like not shifting over at all or becoming different colors? Uh, but how, how do you make it where it where how do you paint the track so that uh, so that it fades, and that if you if you if you find one of those, that's an eigenvector. Okay, so let me let me try to motivate one, one uh, just one more uh, fraction. So when you talk about successfully applying a, uh, could that correspond to you? You made the mention of you you your head turning away and you're mentally making a model of where the thing is. Is that if you if you continually to keep your head turned away and you allow time to elapse things diffuse more is that kind of what you're trying to convey yeah that's what that's what i meant by what the, how you can interpret this what why you would ever have this fade out like this okay, okay. It's, it's your uncertainty about a thing in the world that you're not currently observing and and basically there is a there is a this is a model of how you might extend you know the fact that the rat could be you know in one second could be somewhere in a circular radius of, you know, you know, six inches. And if it, you basically have an intuitive sense, if you wait long enough, it could be at further and further radius. So if I'm trying to recapture the image, you know, the rat, I, I'd have to look in a wider area. Is that kind of where we're going yes. with this? Okay. Oh, that's, that's what, that's what this part, uh, that's what this definition does, but that's not the main topic here. I'm not okay. going to be talking about uh, simulating random walks for multiple time steps. I'm, I'm just introducing what an eigenvector is in this context. Does that give you more of a model, Jeff? Uh, slowly. I, I have one more question. Why are you showing two eigenvectors of different frequencies? Uh, where did that come from? I was showing two examples of, of eigenvectors. And I translate uh, that into like two grid cell modules at different uh, spatial uh, scales. Uh, scales. Is that yes. how I might interpret that? Okay. Yes. All right. And would, uh, if you were to show all the eigenvectors, would they be sort of offset? They, you, there could be eigenvectors that are like eigenvector one, but just where the blue and red are flipped or? Uh, it, it's actually, is close, it's not flipped, it's shifted by 90 degrees. It's like a, okay. the relationship between a cosine and a sine. Uh, but yes, there's a, there's, a, there's a cosine and a sine at each frequency. But that's not, I think maybe where you, I thought where you're coming from Subita is the idea that we, in a grid cell, we can activate the same, different cells that, you know, re-anchor at different points. And, but that's not what's happening here because this, this 90 degree thing wouldn't be re-anchoring, right? Or would it? I, I was just saying there'd be like different grid cell in a given module would be. Yeah, yeah. Shifted. So, yeah. yeah, yeah. So, but, but that doesn't sound like that here because if it's restricted to 90 degrees and that's, in a grid cell module, you have a finer granularity than that. So yes, and I'm gonna I'm gonna make a better mapping than that. That I'm the sines and cosines of these are not a good way to describe the phases. I'm gonna do something better than that in here. Uh, yeah, and eigenvectors will also give you like a minimal set, the exact minimal set you need, which might not be exactly the same as what we have in a module. 
Is that what the next thing yeah. says is like they're good basis vectors because they're not over complete? Is that the idea? Is that, uh... it's, it's not it's not because they're over completeness. Uh, I, I don't know. Maybe it's that's not what I was going to say, though. Oh, okay. uh, but I, I'm, I, I do, I'll jump down to here. Um, yes. The reason we talk about eigenvectors is they they act as a sort of natural basis for uh, uh, the thing you're representing. Um, and there are, there are two general motivations here, and really there are two branches of this presentation that go, that go with these. Uh, one, the key one, the key benefit of using an eigenbasis, of using the eigenvectors as your basis, is that it allows you to um, d perform computations locally, where, where you only have to, um, okay, it's, Probably the clearest way to say to this group is the same way grid cell modules break um, path integration into multiple local modules. Um, when you move into uh, when you move into representing something in in its eigenbasis, a very analogous thing happens, and I'm going to depict the, the below. Uh, the second motivation that really is uh, quite different in my mind, at least. Is, um, is dimensionality reduction, uh, if, like the whole principal component analysis view of representing stuff. Um, and th there's, there's intersection between these two, but I'm kind of keeping them separate for this presentation. Can, can I ask uh, one, one, one more quick technical question? So yeah. you, ch you, you showed one eigenvector from one particular system. There's, there's multiple ones because you know, of the dimensionality of the system. So you chose to show the eigenvector Presumably, it had the largest eigenvalue. In other words, the most prominent one. Is that kind of what I'm intuiting from here? No, I kind of jumped to showing ones that would demo better. Uh, the 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 first one's very boring. It's just uniform. Uh, the second one would have been a single. Uh, um, it would have been a single cosine wave. Uh, okay. uh, sorry. Okay. Uh, it, so it would have been a scale of one. So I started with scale of two and scale of three. So the, I just chose two that would demo well. Okay. So uh, now, now this I did this in one D to introduce the concept. Uh, so now, the, now we move on to two D, and the question is, how can you paint two D space? Sort of how this is a painting of one D space. How can you paint two D space so that a, so that a random walk uh, will scale each pixel? And um, and there are a couple different ways of getting answers to this. Uh, some people have used um, computational solvers like in Python there's numpy and you get things like this um, and and it's a little bit evocative of grid cells and and so that that has that has uh, that has spurred a line of thought um, but I'll also point out that if you solve it a different way if you solve it analytically uh, you get cosines and sines pointing in different directions um, and and these are actually the same as these in some sense. Um, there, I've grouped these in a way uh, where, uh, where normally if you take two eigenvectors and add them together, you don't get another eigenvector. Uh, mm -hmm. you, if, if you take these two paintings of space uh, and average them together, uh, the, the, the result is not going to be something that has this magical diffusing property. Um, but sometimes, sometimes it is the case that they do. Uh, and, and this is one of those cases. Uh, Sometimes multiple vectors form an eigen space. Uh, th these are like a, th these four vectors are like a basis where every single linear combination of them is also an eigen vector, um, and these are our linear combinations of these. So I put this little box over here. Sometimes linear combinations of eigen vectors are also eigen vectors, um, and it, ha it happens when their eigen value is the same, when their scaling factor is the same. And so I just wanted to throw this out there that um, that. So in some papers, you'll see something like this, and in some other papers, you'll see something like this. And they, they're both two ways of showing the same eigenspaces. Uh, basically, these are four orthogonal vectors in that space. These are four orthogonal vectors in a space, and they're kind of rotations of each other. Uh, and so that's mostly just drawing a connection to, um, to other work, uh, to, to wh where other people have have gone with this. Um, I, I any, because, uh, go, on. go ahead, Neil. I think it was Neil. Oh, I was just going to say, is there any kind of a, advantage or something in terms of kind of encoding efficiency to the kind of combined 
uh, representation than the, the combined, uh, the, the eigenvector that captures the entire eigenspace in one vector? My real answer is I don't know. Um, it, there may be, but I don't know of it. Okay. These may be completely equivalent or there might be a key benefit of this. Right. So you, you, yeah, so you're saying, uh, Marcus, that any rotations of this A, B, C, and D will give you another set of eigenvectors, right? Um, yes. I, I, if so, you insert these scalars into A, B, C, and D, you'll get, you'll get an eigenvector. Yeah. So the chances of getting, you know, there's all, you know, infinite number of rotations of these. So the chances of getting rotations that line up exactly along the axes are really small. Right, so most rotations are going to look more like the, the upper ones, right? Most solutions. Yes. And that's probably why computationally you end up with the upper ones. And because the chance of solving it computationally and exactly getting access aligned ones, like you show the analytical ones, are, are really small. Yeah. So I, I have a question about your sidebar when you said this happens with any set of eigenvectors that have the same eigenvalue. That would imply that the set of eigenvalues are degenerate because typically eigenvalues are not identical, but you know you can apply them you know uh, the the associated eigenvalue against each of the eigenvectors so i'm I'm just wondering you know am i am I missing something here because um, if 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 they're if if basically when you, when you solve the characteristic equation, it sounds like you have multiple identical roots to, in order to have eigenvalues have the same value. So, I mean, I'm gonna talk about Fourier transform in a little bit and there, for example, I mean, I'm just, I'm kind of jumping ahead or being tech, using technical terminology, but if it, uh, in a Fourier transform, you have the positive sign and the negative sign uh, positive rotations and negative rotations. And in many cases, those have the same eigenvalue of, um, of how, of the positive frequency and the, and it's, and it's conjugate, it's, it's negative, it's corresponding negative frequency. Those I often see. have the same eigenvalue. Okay. So, so that, yeah. that, and in fact, that's what's going on here. I'll, I'll, I'll even tell you that is why, uh, that is why simple cosine waves are, um, are eigenvectors because okay. that's going on here. So you're, you're, you're basically looking at in, in complex space, you get conjugate pairs. So you're gonna, you're, okay, I get you. Hopefully that helped. I have a very simple, uh, just something I don't understand about this diagram. Yeah. So you're saying you can combine the, 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 those linear ones on the bottom and you'll get this other representation at the top. Yeah. And then you say, okay, a, are A, B, C, and D scalars in this case? What, I mean, yes. okay, so you have to pick those scalars carefully to get those, uh, the ones you show up above, or I'm, you know, I'm just- Sometimes, yeah, some of them. For example, you can see this one right here is almost this one. It has yeah. it's, it's been, so, so um, you do have to choose them carefully, yes. Uh, it, yeah, it's, I'm not gonna just say this, this is this time plus this, you have to- mm -hmm. but, but this is a linear combination of these four. Okay, but it's, I guess I'm a little confused, but I just don't know where these A, B, C, D come from. <laughs> just, you know, they picked out a hat, where, where, what, are, what do they represent? Um, uh, or is it it's just, really, this sentence, th this is a picture of the sentence. Linear combinations of eigenvectors can also be eigenvectors. Okay. And then so, this was me depicting what a linear combination is. Okay, but then you show four of these linear ones down below and you show four ones up above, but by different linear combinations, I could end up with a whole ton of different ones up above. Um, yes. So, so it's not like these four map into those four. It's like these four can map into an infinite number of ones up above. Is that right? Yes, correct. Okay. Uh, they just, just they're not four random ones. I'll just throw in these are orthogonal to each other. Mm -hmm. it's, it's four orthogonal basis vectors. This is four orthogonal basis vectors. So then that would, that would restrict what my scalars A, B, C, D are, right? Yes. Okay. Or, or at, at least, yes, yes, there is a restriction. But technically any combination. Can, any well, combination yeah. work, but if you want them orthogonal, then you, then, then you have yes. specific combinations. Yes. Okay. It's just a more of a mathematical statement than representing anything in particular. Yeah. Okay. 
Yeah, so, okay, this was my section where I was introducing the picture of painting a space so that uh, so that it diffuses, uh, so that the, the paint fades when you do apply a random walk. Um, uh, that was the, that was the the image I wanted to convey of eigenvectors. So um, the the paper that really put all this on on my radar is this work from Kim Stackenfeld, Matt Botvinnik, and Sam Gershman. Uh, the hippocampus has a predictive map, um, and in this they go a different direction than talking about grid cells in terms of space. They I, the way this is me putting my spin on it. How I would describe theirs. How I would contrast it. Uh, they they treat it as graphs, as thinking of 2D space as like a, um, like a, 2D, a 2D graph. I'll show a picture of what I mean there. Um, so, but here, so there's kind of a, this, this presentation kind of diverges into two parts here. One is thinking of eigenvectors, like in a way that could have, I could have just said non-Foyer, uh, not, not in a way that's like the Fourier transform, but where the Fourier transform is kind of just a special case here. Uh, in this field, there's like a the, there's this field, this area of study called spectral graph theory, where they fit grid cells into that. Um, so there are things I want to uh, bring up here. So this brings me into: um, Is it useful to think of the hippocampal formation as a graph processor rather than a space processor, or or, or and 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 what are grid cells' uh, role in that in all of that? Um, one thing just independent of, of this, but to motivate it a little bit, I want to focus on a, a thing that people don't always talk about with grid cells because they like focusing on the nice parts, uh, is, is that, um, something that kind of, I don't know, plagues the field, especially the experimentalists is that the, is that grid cells, their firing fields are often, uh, distorted and not, not clean in the way that you would, you would ideally expect them to be. Um, there, there are lots of papers showing this. Uh, so, so some intentionally put them in weird rooms and that, and that might seem like kind of an edge case to you, but even like the Moser group did this one where all they did was used a much larger box. And even within the room, uh, the, the grid has distortions and just a big clean box. Uh, and, uh, and you can talk about other uh, other variations on this. This is, as far as I know, that this isn't published yet. But these two groups, uh, the 3D grid cells, um, it's not published. So I got these very mediocre photos uh, of a screencast. I was at this presentation, but I didn't want to take out my phone. Uh, so um, what you'll see, what you would see here, if if they were good photos, is that the grid cells in 3D, both in bats and in rats. Uh, are they have these you know blobby firing fields, but they're not really cleanly arranged in space like you would want them to be. Uh, oh, and they're also they also don't seem to be um, you know the one D bands uh, that, that that we would be an alternate theory on on, on how it could work. Uh, so so the the general theme here is there's kind of an elephant in the room uh, uh, around grid cells and grid cells is a metric space uh, and uh, that's that like to record these grid cells, we make rats perform random foraging in simple environments. Uh, and the simple grid might be an artifact, artifact of the experiment setup. It might be a classic case of you get what you measure, like you're, you're, you're causing the grid to arise by the experiment paradigm, but there's not a better way. So it's, it's, a, it's a tough problem to wrestle with. Uh, and so, so one, one way a theory kind of can get, um, can, get ahead is by explaining these distortions. And that's where this alternate view of grid cells come in. I'll just jump ahead and say, I'm going to say that there's something that this, this theory is not covering that I, that, uh, that, that I think is not good. So, na namely, it doesn't handle the, ver the multiple spatial phases of grid cells. But to, to spend a couple minutes on it. Um, well, so could you just say again, just I want to make sure I understand, it doesn't handle yeah. the multiple phases. I mean, it doesn't show how individual cells will repeat. Is that what it doesn't, you mean? It doesn't show how uh, the, there will be multiple cells with the same grid, but shifted, but translated. Also known as grid cell modules. Uh huh. So, it, I mean, that seems like a requirement for path integration. Is yeah. That, so, another way to say it, this doesn't have a path integration component to it. Is that? 
not that I can, not that I've been able to deduce. Uh, it doesn't have a set of phases hmm. for a given scale. Or, that, seems or like a, that seems like a huge hole that, that has to be at least recognized. Um, yeah, I, that's the same conclusion I come to here, uh, down here. Uh, okay. So yes, yes, that is, that is a huge hole. There, it's possible that they, that, uh, that some people who work on this have, have found a way to bring phases into it, but I haven't been able to find it myself uh, by, by trying I mean, to most understand people, them. Yeah, it must be when they relate sort of principal components analysis or into neural coding. I think uh, Bruno Olshausen did this first is they, it, it's clear now that you have to have these overcomplete bases uh, to, to really represent neural responses. And I, I wonder if, if you have overcomplete bases and sparse coding, whether now you suddenly get all of those, uh, you know, sh uh, all of the shifts that we, we want in a module. Uh, that's not, I mean, the words make sense. I don't understand why making an overcomplete basis set would, would all of a sudden introduce path integration. Well, not path integration, but give you all of the small shifts that you need in a module. The, the problem with just pure eigenvectors and principal components analysis is that it, it creates a really minimal, oh, I see. Uh, minimal encoding of, of things. So you don't really, if you don't have to have all of those shifts at the same frequency to, to reconstruct the output, it's not going to create no. them. Um, see, but it seems so. to me the critical component is the path integration component. And, and, and you, you could have path integration without having all the shifts, the small shifts. It seems to me you could. Um, um, anyway. I think it seems to me you're coming at this with a theory and other people are coming at it for, with uh, experimental data. Uh, and those are both useful ways to come at this. But, I, but if you talk about the fact like it's been observed that grid cells come in multiple phases, uh, I want to explain that. Um, uh, this doesn't do that. Uh, and yeah, okay. You know, but but, but Subutai may have actually just provided a solution. I, I, I can't speak to that right now. Remember, the, uh, recently I've been arguing that, or at least exploring the idea that um, you have these uh, linear 1D modules, but the 1D modules may not be linear in, in space, right? They, they could represent any kind of movement vector. And I'm wondering if that, um, that to me would suggest that when you look at the combinations of those uh, those individual uh, 1D vectors uh, that are not necessarily linear, <laughs> um, that they could be cur curving and things like that. Um, if you look at the combination of those, you might you would end up with a sort of a odd shaped, you know, 2D grid cell assemblies. And, um, I, I'm just wondering if that could explain this same sort of issue. But anyway, I'll let you I'll let you keep going. This does not explain the the multiple phases and the, and the path integration. Right. I, I want to spend a minute saying how this did kind of expand my imagination and, and it made me want to get it to work, but I still couldn't get uh, it to work. At least I couldn't get this to explain grid cells, but it still is an interesting idea that, um, so I, I I'm hoping j just a couple pictures might be able to expand someone's imagination. Maybe you've thought of these things, but th this was helpful to me to think of it this way. Um, so you can choose to look at 2D space as a continuous graph where it, like every, every point in this is kind of a tiny state and they're almost infinitesimally tiny. This, this is a point of view on thinking of space as, as graphs. Um, and their theory here, um, I'll come back to this in a second. I want to continue with the run I'm doing. Um, so you can construct 2D space from a graph. Um, but graphs are more general than 2D space. This isn't the only thing you can construct with this. Uh, if you think of this as like a thread or like you're, you're weaving together a space using this graph, but you can weave together all sorts of spaces. Uh, for example, maybe entorhinal cortex can create these strange hybrids of, of a 1D track connected to a 2D space uh, that's connected to a 3D space. Uh, it, you can imagine your mental models as you learn things, as you learn tasks, as you learn video games, whatever it is your brain's doing, you, it, it is compelling the idea that, uh, that your brain is kind of stitching together something like this, but where it's able, it's like graphs with, con where graphs but with continuity, graphs that can thread, that can kind of,
create spaces. Uh, and this line of logic, what was compelling to me was that you can create these. And I'm just trying to... Are you saying these, you are, these are separate graphs that somehow are combined together? I'm not sure. I, I could have drawn a bunch of little circles here, a bunch, a bunch of tiny dots here uh, across this surface. Mm -hmm. uh, I could have drawn a bunch of tiny dots just going across this line. Mm -hmm. And I could draw a bunch of tiny dots filling this volume. Yes. Uh, and, and the idea of building up spaces like that and somehow using grid cells to navigate them uh, has haunted me for a while. And I wanted to understand if, if, um, if this whole line of thinking could, um, I'm just trying to understand, is that like what I think is a 1D is, would I say, would I think of the 1D as a, a 1D module and the 2D as a 2D module and there's another module that's 3D modules or is there one grid cell module that has all of these things? Uh, that's, how, that's the part I'm having trouble imagining. Um, I would say if, if you tried to, um, if you tried to do this with grid cells, probably the first thing I would do is, is um, you would use 1D modules for, for all of it and, and it kind of goes with what you were saying a little while earlier that um, 1D modules for all of it, but then you get to this, this space over here and now the 1D modules point in different directions. Hmm. Um, but I guess I'm, what I'm really trying to do is sell the big picture of a mental model of what hippocampal formation could be doing uh, and, and how grid cells could fit into that. Um, and, and the fact that um, that say, say you build up a model of hippocampal formation uh, like this, and then you, you do have a set of cells taking the eigenvectors here. So this gets back, back to painting the space, uh, it, it, painting the space where random walks cause the color to diffuse in a uniform way or in a, a, by a scalar. Um, by the way, th this is the weirdest part of this talk. I'm going to bring it back to things you're more familiar with soon. Uh, so, so I, but I really wanted to, what I want to do is give credit that this expanded my imagination before I say what, that I don't like, uh, that, that it doesn't cover phases. So I, I think I'm going to move on from here, other than just to say that this, what this has going for it is a good, it does a good job of describing uh, distortions of the grid uh, and, and painting and coming up with kind of a different theory of what grid cells are doing that does account for the distortions. Could you, I mean, uh, could you der derive those? I mean, I mean, the distortions come because, is this learned or is it, um, uh, can you relate it back to reality? Like, okay, so you have this sort of mathematical model that explains that these distortions, but how did the, how did the, how does the animal get to that point? Um, did it learn these distortions? I, I just, I'm missing something. I, I just, okay, you have this mathematical formalism that can explain why they'd be distortions, but so where did it come from? <laughs> you know, um, I'm missing that. Yeah, I, I, best thing I can say is learned. I mean, you, like you say, there is kind of a mathematical formalism. How do you paint the space as mathematical as that sounds? Uh, yeah. But, but um, and I would say my, my best answer I can give is that it's learned, but I also am not someone who's spent years trying to defend this. So they, they didn't, that responses. wasn't part of this paper or they, they just they didn't go there, is that right? Not that I was able to pick up. Okay. Yeah. Just, j just to kind of interject, <clears throat> that picture you showed is, is representative of something called a simplicial complex. Yes, exactly. And it basically that's a way of navigating multidimensional spaces. I mean, you can think of uh, uh, the distance of any point from any of those four vertices as a, as a one dimensional construct basically gives you uh, very centric coordinates, which allows you to navigate higher dimensional spaces with a set of coordinates. So it, it's a cool concept. I don't know if it's reflected in the, in the grid cells, but if, 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 you're, if you're pushing an idea that you wanna represent you know, uh, sets of, of one dimensional things to represent high dimensional spaces, it's not a bad starting point. And I would say that's exactly uh, the kind of thing that people who work on this are thinking about. But, okay, uh, this gets into, now I'm kind of be, going to be preaching to the choir here, but at, at least my opinion here is the most interesting fact about grid cells isn't that they fire in a grid, uh, that they have grid-like firing fields. The most interesting fact is that, uh, is that multiple cells have the same grid shifted, and, and not everyone 
knows this, but these shifts are stable across environments. And really importantly, uh, I've, I've picked this part up by talking to people at posters and stuff, but, but the, the grids are also um, stable across distortions. Uh, so, so across, even when there is a distortion in the grid, it kind of stretches this out to where, uh, p p this is from the original seminal paper about grid cells. This is showing where multiple grid cells fire. And this, you can see that blue, blue and green, the blue cell and the green cell are always at the same spatial relationship to each other. Um, and even in the case where there's distortions, they're still at the same spatial relationship to each other. And to me, this still gives a strong evocative image of, of space. There is a spatial representation, even if it's distorted, even if a physical space is mapped into it. Uh, in a distorted way. Uh, and, and in this graph view of it, it's not, th there's not so much of a space. It's different. It's, 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 a, it's fundamentally a graph. Uh, it doesn't have these phases. I, I, I want to see the graph view um, um, explain the multiple phases of the grid. That, that's uh, that's uh, what I feel is kind of lacking on this. And uh, so that's what I said here with someone about to say something. Uh, I was just curious because um, you showed earlier this canonic, this uh, like cone-shaped room or, uh, or pyramid-shaped room. Kind of, I, know, I was just wondering if um, do you know are there examples of the kind of distortion even in the distortion? That the, oh, sorry, no, um, the experimental example of the not a cone, sorry, a, um, like a, a triangle. It was a bit, a bit further up. Oh, uh. uh uh, was the trapezoidal room? Yeah, that, that one, yeah. I got it, got it. Yeah, sorry, trapezoidal. Um, I was just trying to visualize what kind of, because you mentioned that the, the spatial relations are still maintained despite distortions. And I was just trying to uh, picture uh, what that would look like. I don't, do you know, are there kind of um, examples or is that just kind of stuff you've seen around? So I don't think it has been studied in these dramatic distortions like this. It has right. been studied with this data set right here. They, they did study it. It was the Moser group. Did it. They studied it on this particular data set. And they found that um, in this case, the relationships are preserved. Uh, right. I don't know. Okay. With, the, with the really open rooms. No, that's interesting though. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Uh, so uh, just to close on this part, uh, let's see, I, I do like, I do think that they, they bring an interesting perspective to understanding the distortions and that like that distance um, distance on the you know the grid cell map um, might not be measured in meters or might not be measured in actual physical space. It might be more time based where if you, if you tend to move through a certain area of space faster uh, then you want it to be kind of more compressed. Um, and you can go even more dramatic with this. If there are spaces that you're unlikely to move to, if there are parts of a room you're unlikely to move, you might distort the grid that did not really give much, uh, much memory space to that part of the room. And, and they do these kinds of things in the way they set this up. And I think that that's going to be important for understanding the grid. So understanding the distortions. That, that, so, that sounds familiar to the, the point I've been making recently that I asked myself, how does, the, how does the brain learn the dimensionality of the thing it's observing? And to me, the, I've kind of backed into this belief that the only way it can learn the dimensionality is by observing movements, that movements themselves define the dimensionalities of the space. It's not linear movements, it's not linear distances, it's just movements. So what, where you can move, it defines where you can model and how fast you move in a direction defines what that looks like so it, it seems consistent with this idea um, that, and that also is consistent with the idea that they're distortions because movements aren't perfectly linear and they don't have same speeds and so on. So I'm just pointing that, I'm, I'm saying this just to remind myself that, <laughs> that I'm, I'm, that's how I want to, that's how I'm trying to solve these problems is to get looking about as movements as the defining um, basis of how to measure space. And so it was consistent with what you were just saying, Marcus. Yeah, I, I agree. I, yeah, I agree that you've been saying something similar to this. So, okay, rewinding, going back to the more familiar land. Um, now, I'm, now I'm gonna talk about things that are familiar to you, but in different terminology. 
And so you're going to be able to map this onto your mental model, but it's going to be in ways that you haven't, mo uh, most of you haven't thought of before or seen before. Uh, so now I'm going back and just to call out the two papers, in some ways, the, the, the paper that caused me to finally t put all this together is, is this one from uh, Cheng Min Yu, Tim Barron's and Neil Burgess, uh, where they kind of take all of the, 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 they take navigation and path integration um, and put it into kind of eigen language, talking about it in terms of eigenvectors. Um, uh, but I will say it's, it's a very similar paper to this other one that came out uh, in 2013 from Jeff Orchard, but he describes it in terms of the Fourier transform. Um, and, but they're really kind of the same thing. Uh, here I just say like, I, when, when you're dealing with 2D space, eigenvectors of 2D space are the Fourier transform. So, so the rest of this presentation you can treat as, uh, you, if you want to start ignoring the word eigenvector and think of Fourier modes instead, feel free to think about that instead. Uh, both of these papers make a lot of the same connections. They both talk about velocity controlled oscillators, how both of these lead to a theory of what you what might be 1D grid cell modules or voltage, velocity controlled oscillators, VCOs. Uh, so, so there's a lot of the similar things covered here, but this one really dives into the eigen, uh, eigen language and talks about a few other things and does a few other experiments. Uh, now, so I'm gonna use some of the ideas from these papers, uh, but but kind of describe it in a way that connects a little bit better with with this group. Uh, so um, so these if if you remind if you remember where we left off back when we were uh, right here, um, these start to resemble one D grid cell modules, uh, but in ways that we we've, we've talked about. It's kind of um, it doesn't feel exactly like them. It just kind of vaguely resembles them. And now I want to make it be exactly them. Uh, and so so. Some of you will have seen this kind of thing before, but um, I, want, I want you to look at these color maps a little bit differently. Um, rather than thinking of it as a single unit and how it fires at different locations, um, think of it as showing what phase is active at different locations. Uh, so showing what phase, and this phase can be you could, you could imagine a ring attractor, sort of like head direction cells, except for movement. Um, uh, it's like a 1D grid cell module. Um, or you could imagine this ring being a, some kind of temporal phase, like a, a velocity controlled oscillator, where, this, where the unit is firing at a particular time relative to some other, uh, some other oscillation. Um, or if you, if you want to do this all with engineering, uh, you, can, you can do this with complex numbers if you're doing this on computers. Uh, and, and it, there's, there's an analog I want to draw here is in neuroscience, if you see people using complex numbers in a model, it's often a useful idea to say like, wait, can I plug in a ring for this? Or can I plug in a VCO? Uh, because often they're representing the same thing. That's often the reason people use complex numbers is they want something that, that goes around a unit circle like this. So often a ring is an analog for a complex number or the complex unit circle. What is, what is the VCO say? Yes, yeah, so a, a, a velocity controlled oscillator is, is like a, um, you can think of a, a neuron that fires at a particular time relative to uh, the, the theta frequency. So, so you have these oscillations going through, through the hippocampal formation in the cortex, and you have a unit that's firing at some time relative to all of that. Um, uh, like a, a fixed time or a, f a fixed phase? Uh, uh, a a fi fixed phase relative oh, okay. to that. Uh, 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 is that right, Mar Marcus? Uh, I, I would have described it differently, so maybe I Okay, go on. Um, go on. The term voltage controlled oscillator means you have something that's oscillating, and the frequency at which it's oscillating is controlled by voltage. And, um, and that the, um, the basic idea here is that uh, there's a theta frequency um, that is a base theta frequency, and you have other cells that are also firing at the base theta frequency. But um, based on movement, the frequency of the other cells increases slightly. And so the, the cell now is then its, 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 its phase is progressing slowly relative to the base frequency. So you, you increase the frequency of 100, and now something's going 101, just 
pick the numbers. Yeah. And, and so it, and so then when you stop moving, it's the, the frequency stops, it gets back to the theta frequency. So now that cell is oscillating at the theta frequency, but at a different phase than it was earlier. Um, mm, so, okay. I'm not, I think what you, what you said, Marcus, didn't strike me as that. I, I, don't, I, don't I was you. trying to say the same thing you just said. So I, I may have misspoken, but uh, in my, in my mind, we both just said the same thing. Okay. We All right. Well, my apologies for that uh, then. I might um, have miscommunicated. What's really confusing. No, that, that, that makes sense. Thank you. What's confusing me about the voltage oscillators, and, and I'm looking at this picture, it's confusing here again too, is that there's sort of the need for this um, variable frequency that's slightly faster than at times when you're moving. It seems to be pretty uh, hard to get around this because of the phase precession observed. Um, but what is the actual thing that's, in, so in one, one proposal, there's a set of neurons, each one oscillating at a slightly different phase, but they're all being controlled, their frequencies all being controlled together. Um, and the other example we heard about was different uh, dendrites on, a, on an individual neuron um, oscillating at different frequencies, uh, sort of progressing, yeah, different phases, excuse me. Um, and so, so that's all very confusing to me. So when you show these pictures of these little circles around them, I, on the next of the colored bars there, I was trying to figure, are those five different neurons you're referring to, or is that one neuron? I, I was confused by that, Marcus. Right. Uh, it's because I'm drawing a picture that can be interpreted either as a ring or as VCO. So in a ring, there would be different neurons in a ring attractor, mm -hmm. uh, but in, in a VCO, it would be the same neuron firing at different phases relative to the base frequency. Okay, well, that's complex for me, but all right. <laughs> okay, good enough. I, I, I don't know a better way to depict it. It's, it's all right, it's, it's, good. It's, it's good can, enough. Can I ask a question about your representation? You've got one cycle of the phase, but you've uh, got it a, a, a bounced, uh, I mean, in other words, the uh, bottom and top uh, phases uh, both uh, map to the same color. So I was just wondering if that was semantically uh, interesting or it just happened chance because of the color map you picked? So, so I wondered if this question would come up. So uh, here, I'll come back to this in a second. Technically the full sec set of eigenvectors includes, includes phases going in both directions. Uh, and so, so what, what, what happens is as you move in one direction, a ring is, or a VCO is, is orbiting. And you're and you're right that creates this ambiguity of like there's this light blue is being mapped to two different phases. Uh, that's just I don't know a better way to visualize it. I guess you could have used it. I, yeah, I don't know a better way to visualize it. So um, uh, I, I would just start from a, a red and cycle through to red uh, in one cycle rather than uh, doing a bounce cycle. If if you want them to be unique, this is a totally valid point. Uh, that I'm, would be I'm missing the point. A bounce cycle. I don't know what that means. I, I thought you were asking why is there red twice in this He's picture? going, yeah, he's going to red no, to he, purple and purple back to red and instead of one cycle of red cyclically back to red. He, so why, the, the real question is why is light blue appear here twice? Is that, is that the same question, Kevin? Yes. Okay. If I'd used a different color map that never repeats a color, this would have been better. Okay. All right. Uh, I, 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 I'm, I'll just read that properly then. Uh, yeah, you're, that, that was a good point. I, I'd never considered that, that you could use a different color map that, that oscillates rather than, you know, going to blue and then back or going to purple then back. Um, so I, I won't say any more, anything more about the, um, the, the complex eigenvectors there, but, but there is a technicality there. Uh, so, so I guess I did draw this thing, like often in neuroscience, when you see maps like this, it's talking about how a single unit responds, but now I'm drawing a map like this and I'm talking about how a single uh, 1D grid cell module or a single VCO, a single set of, yeah, yeah, a single VCO cell responds. Uh, and so it's a, just a different way of looking at color maps. As Kevin points out, I, I, there's a better, I could use better color maps for that idea. Uh, though I guess what, what I can say for this is it's good that it, cause it's showing um, and in terms of eigenvectors. And it, uh, this is showing the real component of an eigenvector. Uh, okay, bringing this back home to, um, so, so you can treat, uh, you can represent space using a set of rings or a set of VCOs. Um, 
if you wanted, you could represent two of those rings at once. Uh, it, you could have one population of cells representing two different rings. Uh, and that would be a grid cell, except it would be a square grid. Uh, but, uh, and so you can get, you can work your way toward um, a location system based on square grids simply by following like the eigenpath, uh, but simply by saying, how would I do all this with eigenvectors? Um, and I'm not saying this is how grid cells are derived, but it's sort of a proof for why you can do a lot of operations with, with a torus, which that is composed of two rings. Um, now, now I'm going to talk about displacement cells as, as we're familiar with. And uh, so, so th this gets into where, um, where I said earlier that if you think of what are the eigenvectors of location, what are the eigenvectors of 2D space? Uh, or uh, uh, um, at how if you, if you follow that line of logic and you build a system based on it, you land on something that closely resembles grid cells and use, has the same computational uh, tricks as grid cells. So, um, so here I've shown, uh, here I'm showing the basic operation of applying a displacement vector to a location. A location is represented as a set of, in this I show 1D phases or 2D phases. And, and the kind of the key trick of the kind of the reason we use an eigenbasis for computation is it, is it does this, uh, it makes computation really convenient where to figure out the new value for this ring, we don't, we only have to look at the, the old value for this ring and, and its displacement vector. This does not depend on this, this, or this. Um, and, and the second ring. I, I thought, I, thought I, I think I know what you're saying, but the words didn't match up in my head. Yeah. Um, when you said you only have to look at it, would you just go through that sentence again? Would it? Yeah, so, so here I'm showing, um, you know, when, when somebody walks through why we talk about eigenvectors, um, they'll show a picture that I'm showing right here except they'll be putting numbers, uh, th they'll use numbers in all of these locations rather than rings. Um, uh, uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm showing how, uh, okay, grid cell modules perform, uh, at least in our mental model of them, they perform their updates locally. The grid cell module only needs to know how to update itself. It only needs to know its own displacement. It only needs to know its own previous state. It doesn't need to know the state, previous state of others. But, but, um, but here, these four circles you're showing, uh, those are four different grid cells in some sense? Is that what you're saying? Uh, there are, the, I, this I, is I, four I different this... grid cell modules, four uh -huh. different 1D grid cell modules, four different VCOs of, that are uh, different, um, different scales. Uh, you can you can interpret it as multiple things. Yes, okay. four different grid cell modules, especially this right here. This is a square yeah. grid module. Yeah, yeah. And then, uh, and then the sentence where you said you only have to look at something. What was that sentence? Sure. Uh, so matrix multiplication. When when uh, when a matrix is, is diagonal, that means that this dimension, this the, yeah, this coordinate only depends on um, on this one. And 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 this value, uh, that so matrix multiplication. Normally, you have to do like kind of yeah. across. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Everything has to look at everything. But that's the kind of the special thing about a diagonal matrix is that you don't have to do that. Everything's local. Uh, okay, that's just basically saying our displacement modules, as we defined them, are there's one per grid cell module, and they don't need to know anything else. Yeah, is that, is that equivalent to that? Yeah, I'm. Okay. I'm very. I'm right now. I am 100% taking an idea you already understand and putting different language on. I'm it. just. I'm just still trying to make sure I understand it. That's yeah, all. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I appreciate you trying to dumb it down for me. <laughs> okay. Okay. And uh, and quick technicality here. Um, if you do this, if you kind of if you kind of stay in the um, the um, keep your mind on the Fourier tracks, uh, you might reach a conclusion that uh, that this is going to give you a particular set of scales. It's going to give you a scale of like one, a scale of 
two, a scale of three, a scale of four, uh, because this is what the Fourier modes are. Um, but I, but that is true if you if you analyze this by thinking of space as a one D track that wraps around, or two D a two D room that wraps around. But if you think of space instead as extending off into infinity, then any in this case, sine wave, because I'm using 1D space, any sine wave is a valid um, eigenvector, is a valid for, uh, yeah, a valid eigenvector, even even though this starts on red and ends on blue. Uh, if you think of it as extending off into infinity, it's still a valid eigenvector, uh, which means that like some people hold themselves to this constraint as if like this theory requires it, but this theory does not require this constraint. You don't have to have the scales be this exact set of factors. You know, there's, it, 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 can I interpret this? I know these are now, um, these are not grid cells we're looking at here, but there's some analogy to them, I guess. I'm, yeah. Um, it, uh, you know, there's this big problem with grid cells. And the big problem with grid cells is that the calculations we want to do don't work if the cell repeats within a particular environment. That is, if we want to determine the, uh, the movement vector to get from one point to another, and we can look at the displacement cells to calculate them, but it fails if that cell reports multiple times. Um, it's, it's, like, it's like you want, we want the path integration properties of grid cells, but we don't really want the repetition property within the environment we're working with because the calculations we want to do get messed up at that point. I don't know if, if I have to explain why, but so, you know, originally grid cells were missed because they didn't, they weren't, they were at such a large scale that they didn't repeat within the room, right? That, that's why they were missed. And when you, and if we assume that they don't repeat within the room, then all the calculations we want to do, the displacement calculations and the, and the movement vector calculations are solvable. But if they start repeating, well, that still it works, makes sense from a path integration point of view, but the calculations we want to do using displacement cells start to fail. Um, so I'll, I, I don't know if that makes sense, but the reason I'm mentioning that is that to me, almost all the things we, we want to do with grid cells that are interesting, really we want to do them in grid cell modules where the scale is larger than the, the thing we're modeling. So, so I don't actually get repeats within that. Does, does that make sense? Yeah, uh, that's, I wonder if that, that might be the right mental model. It, 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 in that mental model, you don't need the combinatorial code anymore. It's mostly you just need different scales for handling different types well, of- Well, I, what I guess it just struck me is I don't need this thing to wrap around perfectly. It just, in some sense, as you said, just goes on infinitely. I don't actually get to the repetition in my model. I don't get okay. to the point where the cell repeats because um, I want this, I want the, the extent of the module to be larger than the thing I'm modeling. Mm. Um, that was one of the problems with grid cells and with displacement cells. They don't really, you can't really calculate distances and displacements if the scale of the grid cell module is smaller, it repeats within the, within the size of the thing you're modeling. Do you know what, do you know what I'm talking about, Marcus? Well, let's see, the, if you use the whole, multiple grid cell modules uh, to to get a very long coding range, uh, then you can get displacement representations over long distances. Um, I didn't follow those words. Um, just, let's just take, let's just take a single linear grid cell module. And, um, and I wanna determine how what movement I should make to get from point A to point B. Well, um, I can calculate that as long as point B doesn't repeat multiple times within the environment. Mm -hmm. um, if it repeats multiple times, then I can't calculate it. And that same problem extends to multiple modules. Um, it's same with our displacement cells. Uh, our displacement cells say, hey, well, I can, I can form a unique representation where this new thing as well as just the old thing, which is displacement cells just one way of, in one of its forms that calculates movement vectors. Um, but if, if the destination point is repeats, I can't do it. So it just, I, I feel that we always show these pictures of grid cells repeating within an environment, but I've come to the sort of belief that they don't work in that space. You have to, you have to find a scale that's bigger than the environment. Um, and then, then everything works. I, I think 
I think this problem has been, we identified this problem and other people identified it too, I think in other times, but am I wrong about that? Or is there a solution? Well, I, I, I guess, do, do you acknowledge that multiple grid cell modules, two different scales, can achieve a scale together that is longer than than yes. But if we want to if we want to use displacement vectors to calculate a movement, or to calculate displacement between two objects, those are the two re, two things we use displacement vectors for. Remember, the displacement vector idea is similar to the idea of how do we calculate uh, a movement vector. Right? It's like oh, I have two points. How do I get from point A to point B? I can do that on a module by module basis, and we had the same thing for displacements. It's the same thing. So. It, it forms a unique representation, as you said, um, but we can't do the calculations that displacement cells want, we want to do. Um, that is, you, can do think, you can do long displacements as but well. I think, I think what you said once before, Marcus, you said, yeah, we could do it, but we have to learn it. We have to learn yes. what the, right? But I, I don't want yes, to do exactly. I, I don't, I don't want I to agree. do that. I, I, I just like that too. You yeah. can represent them, but you can't decode them. Yeah, so if I, if I and so that to me was like a, a showstopper. It's like, okay, yes, it's unique, but I have to learn all these unique vectors, impossible. If I constrain myself to a module that, is, that its repeat rate is larger than the thing I'm modeling, then I don't have that issue. I can just basically sum up all the movement, individual movement vectors. Remember, I'm, remember I'm thinking of each um, grid cell as representing a movement vector. And so I can just sum up all the individual movements and I get my answer. I don't have to remember anything. Um, Anyway, so I just, I only mentioned that because I think that might relate to the issue you just talked about here, where you're not forcing these things to yeah. wrap around perfectly. <laughs> maybe it does, maybe it doesn't. <laughs> it just reminded me of it. Um, I'm going to, if I, I'm going to try to talk about some of this stuff on Wednesday. Um, so okay. We'll come back to this again. Yeah, the, the, here I was, one thing I was saying was that if you set this up analytically, you might over constrain yourself technically over the plane over the plane of infinite space any sine wave uh, translated in any way is is an eigenfunction or eigenvector so um so you can you can use this framework and still get the long coding ranges that come from using just kind of random scales mm -hmm. uh and like here i showed that here this has the same it has a repetition of the six module representation on both sides of it uh but this is a total this this never repeats over that span if you just use random scales uh and that was more uh a caution to to people who 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 come at this from this angle that like it really does not supply this constraint some people sometimes people have looked at this and said like you know how um with grid cell modules the scales go up by a factor of about 1.4 uh they've looked at this and said is this roughly 1.4 and they say like yeah kind of like but but th that logic may not need to apply here. Um, okay, I want to jump into an interesting. Uh, 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 so, so this was this was like taking this language, saying you can use Fourier or Eigen language to talk about displacements and everything. Um, now, now I want to see does that take us if we go further, if we if we continue to in, embrace Fourier. Uh, can, are, are there any cool ideas that appear? And at least I want to give you a picture of this idea. Um, the uh, yeah picture of this. So so far we're talking about using multiple modules uh, to represent a single location. So so far we're representing a single location. Um, but the Fourier transform can use be used for much more than that. Uh, you can represent, for example, multiple locations simultaneously. Uh, Fourier transform is often used to represent high detailed images, and here we're using it to represent a single dot. Uh, here I'm laying out just a perspective that like there might be something really interesting here. Um, if the grid cell, if grid cells are indeed doing something resembling Fourier transform, we should consider are they actually doing more uh, really powerful Fourier transform uh, tricks? So, for example, um, can grid cells represent locations relative to three different landmarks uh, and and for those of for anyone here who knows what i mean when i say union uh i'm not talking about a union i'm not talking about having each one be multiple things at one time um in in our traditional use of the word union i'm talking about can this can you set these values can you set each module's value in a way that encodes that i the rat am at this location next 
relative to a landmark, a dislocation relative to the landmark, and dislocation relative to the landmark. Um, sometimes you hear place cells described as being something like this, where place cells are defined by your surroundings, by your the surrounding boundaries, and it, it's almost like a place cell might represent something like this. It's, it is your surroundings, where, where the landmarks are relative to you, or where you are relative to the landmark. Um, and you can draw boundary vector cells in this using the same idea. This might be a little bit of a mind shift, but this picture is showing where am I, me being a rat, uh, where am I relative to boundary? And, 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 it, and you start to reach like this computational need of, you almost want to paint a picture of all of my locations. Like I am right here next to this landmark here and here, and I'm right here next to this boundary. Uh, so, so like, say a rat walks into an environment like this, it sees all of these. Um, it's it's boundary vector cells tell it this. It's object vector cells tell it this. Um, can you take that and map that into a grid cell representation? Um, if grid cells are performing an exact Fourier transform, the answer is 100%. Yes, you can do this. Uh, and so I'll jump before saying why this is cool because I it, it might sound a little magical right now. Uh, what you would need to make this work is if grid cell modules have both a phase and a magnitude, here I drew little numbers inside the ring. Uh, so this, this is a little harder to get working with a VCO. You can definitely get it working with a ring. Um, if it has a phase and a magnitude, um, it suddenly becomes capable of representing complicated uh, um, things like this, like, like this line and the, this set of dots. Uh, and so, so you, so what you would get from this is some grid cells in some places would, ha would fire at higher rates or have some kind of higher magnitude than other grid cells. Uh, but path integration works as is you just, you just move the bump around you, 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 you update the phase and keep the magnitude the same. Uh, it, everything would work. You just need the magnet, you need the grid cell module to be able to have a magnitude. Uh, so uh, th this idea would be co cool because you would be able to take, you know, a picture like this from your surroundings, your surrounding boundaries, your surrounding landmarks, um, convert it into a grid cell representation. And that would be like a path integrable fingerprint or in computational terms, a hash for the current environment. Um, you, could, you could take a novel environment find its hash and not have to learn anything. You just, you just, next time you enter this, you're going to use the same trick and activate the same grid cell representation. And this would be a really cool thing for associating memories with locations. Um, so, so the Fourier transform uh, provides an interesting angle here. Uh, and, the, and this is a possible explanation for why grid cell rates do vary across fields. Um, to get that working, you'd have to do a little bit more, but um, if anyone's interested. I, well, uh, that's interesting. I, I don't remember us talking about this, this idea before, this empirical no, idea. No, this is my first time presenting this. I mean, the empirical idea that, that oh, they've, they've observed it. grid cells in code, uh, their firing rate. Well, okay. Remember uh, the missed fields and the t the the paper the David. Yeah, Taylor. but those are those are more like binary. They they, they just disappear. It wasn't like uh, it wasn't described as a scalar. It was more described as hey, they just stopped working. It was more of a, a, a not a rate coding, but more of a, a, a you know a, hmm. a spatial code. That still fits into this, but I okay. I would expect it to be sometimes rate, sometimes binary. Yeah, well, right. that's well, that's that's how it was. That's if I, if I remember that paper, they described it more like, "Hey, these cells just didn't respond at all here, you know." But we expected them to, and and it wasn't like it, it wasn't described as scalar. Maybe that could be an experimental bias or something like that. But that's how they described it. This one was much more scalar, and it was a, it was a little bit. This was more of an appealing experiment because it was an it was a rat moving around in two D space, where this was a mouse on a virtual track running in one D. Uh, the, the missed fields one was the, was r running in one d so so this is more just like uh, less less statistical analysis had to go into it it's just they can simply say the firing rates of in this field are lower than in this field I mean, I mean grid cells encode local positional information I mean isn't that always the case I mean I, I, the no, title like is in, in individual grid cells uh, like you can tell from a grid cell's firing rate which of its fields it's most likely to be in Oh, that's interesting. 
I didn't see that. Um, I want to get that paper, so maybe we better write it down. Um, grid sales and cold open position. Um, yeah, I've gone on for a while. Uh, so this, I, I've painted like a fun picture of something grid cells could do. I, I think it's probably best for me to work on closing this presentation. So, um, I'll go back and just to quickly summarize. Um, so this Fourier Eigen view, I think it is useful to point out to people that if you understand grid cells using this lens, this, this mental model, there are some ideas you're likely to miss because it's, they just are weird in this, when described in this language. Um, so we, we've talked about how displacement cells, are, something that can represent a displacement between two locations can also do this thing where, um, where you represent the spatial relationship between two groups of locations or reference frames. Um, and, and this is harder to see. You have to, you have to know about location spaces and, the, the fact that you can assign a set of unique locations to one object and a set of other unique locations to another object. Um, so, so for this, I would recommend like, sometimes you need other mental images. Here's something that Mirko drew from our, uh, from our other paper. Uh, so when you, when you, sometimes this can be useful to think, if you wanna think about this analytically, think of like multiple grid cell modules as creating a high dimensional torus um, where you can only move in certain directions on the torus through movement but the displacements can can represent any direction. The displacements can move you in any direction on that torus. Um, that was a quick blurb, a cautionary tale to people that this will limit your imagination. And but people in this room understand these ideas already. It's funny. I, I as many times as I've heard the 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 the, the, the representation that you and Merkel like, I still just it just doesn't work for me. I'm sorry. It's like I feel like yeah. I'm a failure here. I'm speaking to the subset of people who think the Fourier uh, view is intuitive. <laughs> I'm, I'm saying those people will be able to and get you, this. You, you know my limitations, more like this. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. And, and, and I guess just like fin final point I wanted to make, I, I'm going to say this in like 20 seconds. Grid cell distortions, I said a little bit of before. I think that like um, grid cell distortions uh, are probably a feature, not a bug. Uh, the brain's probably using it in an interesting way. Uh, and I'm fond of two different ideas. One is that you could call this a conformal mapping where, um, where your, 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 your actual cognitive, I don't know, your actual grid cell map with these clean grid lines is mapped onto space in, this, uh, in a pretty flexible, funky way, but that has certain constraints where, for example, the grid lines always remain orthogonal, um, which is to say, your head direction cells always update linearly, no matter where you are. Uh, th this is a well. This is a study, well studied area that conformal maps can be really good for, um, are are useful computationally, and you can still path integrate over them if you if you if you're careful about it. Uh, if, and then second, like, or you can look at distortions as a form of generalization uh, that that like you have you have a small number of mental maps that you stretch onto different environments. And the fact that this map is being distorted is actually like, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a convenience. It's because you're using your knowledge from the past and stretching it onto your current uh, situation. Um, so, so in general, I still think that because of like the, you know, the different phases of good cells, uh, that the representations are inherently spatial, but the, but space can be mapped into it. Physical space can be mapped into it in a distorted nonlinear way. But the, but the representation itself is still spatial. Uh, so I, I kind of raced through this end part because time was coming short, but this is, this is where I'm ending here. Do you know if there's any experimental evidence for that second idea, like um, distortions being less significant in a, in a familiar environment? Or... <laughs> Uh, the, the irony is it's kind of the opposite. Uh, as as okay. an environment <laughs> becomes better learned, uh, it's that's when like the, the grid kind of distorts a little bit more. Huh. Because I feel like that then supports the first one that maybe as as you develop a better sense of the kind of space or temporal or whatever, like how your movement actually affects the environment, then definitely. Then, then you I would say. That. Yes, yes, I totally agree. I keep coming back to the idea that um, 
the brain doesn't, it, it has no knowledge about the world. It has to discover everything, you know, the cortex at least. And so the only thing it has to work with in terms of figuring out the spaces it's, it's uh, dealing with are movements. It, it, it knows, it says, I have a representation of a movement. I don't know what the movement is. I, I have no idea what the movement is, but I know that it's a movement vector of sort. And, um, and from that, I have to build up my spatial representation. Um, it, it can't sit down and looking and say, oh, this is three-dimensional or two-dimensional or one-dimensional. There's no, no way of doing that. It just says, yeah, I move and these are the changes that I get in my sensory input. And so, again, I feel, I, I've said it earlier, I'll say it again, somewhat for my benefit, is this, that um, the whole idea of space is, is really defined by movements. It can't be defined any other way. And, um, and therefore, it's going to be distorted by what movements you are capable of doing. And, and if you can't move in certain directions, you will not represent that direction and things like that. So when I think about this and trying to understand all these distortions, I would be coming back to that perspective. That doesn't mean anything you just presented here is, is inconsistent with that. I'm, I'm trying to merge the two. I'm just saying that I think we can't ignore this idea of thinking about movements uh, as the foundation for representing space. We have to do that. That has to be sort of the foundational uh, metric in some sense. Yeah, that makes sense to me. And, and I think that is quite compatible, especially with um, this first one kind of. Yeah, and personally, I find it very hard to do this translation from the, you know, the Fourier and the eigenvector spaces. And um, I feel like I should study up this on this more and work at it, but it's, it's difficult for me. And if you want, you could just treat this as you know that the connection is there and on demand, you can go pick it up when you need it. Uh, but uh, all of the things we talk about with displacements and path integration can be described in a way that's super analogous to Fourier or Eigen. Yeah, but as you point out, you got insights from thinking about it this way. So yes. I don't want I don't want to miss those insights. You know, that's the problem. The, it's possible there's a big idea right here. It's also possible it's, I'm just totally crazy and it's not uh, it's not what's happening. Okay. Uh, so we can call this the end of anybody else. Have, anyone else have any questions? Yeah, I had a short, quick question, Marcus. Um, on that, on your slides or on your presentation, you had that last section go full Fourier, where you show those three different orange dots at once. So were you were you trying to imply that grid cells are representing those three locations at once? Yeah, I'm. I'm saying that grid cells, if they have both a phase and a magnitude. We know they have a phase. We kind of know they have a magnitude. I mean, they have different firing rates. Uh, uh, this could be, in fact, what they're representing. Uh, they, they, in the same way that a Fourier transform is, you know, it takes a bunch of waves and reconstructs an image by putting different uh, coefficients on these, by, by shifting this and scaling this, shifting the scaling this, doing that. It can reconstruct an image. And I'm saying, if that if if that's literally what anorhinal cortex is doing, this is what I would use it for. I would use it for representing a set of locations and a set of even stripes. These stripes, like saying where the boundaries are. Uh, yeah. Doesn't, I, so, doesn't that on. imply something else? So, I mean, someone else has to read out that code, right? Um, yeah. If the grid cells are representing that, we want to associate it with something. And so, another neuron has to be reading out that code. But that other neuron then has to be reading out the code based on a set of uh, not just a combination code, but also scalar values of those firing uh, cells, um, which is kind of hard to do on neurons. Yeah. Is that right? I mean, one, one, one part you can imagine is that, so I have this question mark here, but uh, like you could imagine a connections between the grid cells and the boundary vector cells, where in one direction you're doing a Fourier transform, the other direction you're doing inverse Fourier transform. So you can recover either from either. But my point is a boundary vector cell then would have to be paying close attention to the scale of value of the grid cells. Um, they're firing. Yeah. And, yeah. and you'd so, have to have an inverse Fourier transform in neurons. Well, okay. We call it, yeah. If you want to call it that way, sure. Uh, but 
Yeah, which I never think of neurons capable of doing that, right? It's, it's like, it's like, oh, this synapse has to be at this frequency and this synapse has to be at that frequency and this synapse has to be that frequency. And if we have that combination of those three inputs at these three different frequencies and this, then I'll recognize it. I don't know how neurons could do that. I haven't tried to set up a neural version of that. I was going to ask if, um, if this can be done with the kind of Fourier transform, what's to stop uh, someone kind of implementing a system like this, not necessarily in a neural network based uh, like system, but it just, it seems like this would be really powerful um, as kind of, yeah, a module if you want to do things like path integration. Um, but so I was just wondering if, if there's anything that makes that difficult to do, uh, even like ignoring, ignoring neural constraints. Not that I, I, nothing comes directly to mind. I don't think it's a directly hard computational problem. I, I would expect that, um, that if in fact good cells are performing something similar to Fourier magic, uh, they probably do it in, in clever ways that would, that would expand our imaginations, uh, where, where, where like f actual Fourier might be really rigid and constrain us in ways. Like you might find that the brain has done it in some clever, flexible way, uh, but, but that's just a general hunch. Right. 